So we, we have a set agenda, but we, the, we are more than open to change it uh, based on what you need. So what we have uh, planned uh, for this session is, so we are going to give an intro about GDPR. How many of you are familiar with GDPR? Okay. How many have actually implemented GDPR in your companies? Great, yeah. Uh, so then after that, we're also going to talk about so how we implemented GDPR at the WSO2. So not at our product levels, but at WSO2. So as a company, so we work with European customers and we have an office in uh, Europe. So we need to be compatible with GDPR too. So we are going to share with you our journey and then uh, we also need to compatible uh, with GDPR from a pr product point of view too. Like, so our customers, so they who want to be GDPR compliant, they worry about how we are compatible with GDPR in our product stack. So we are going to discuss that too, but let's see like uh, we can drive this session based on your interest. Okay, so let me start with uh, an overview of GDPR, then I'll hand out Ishara. So Ishara will uh, walk you through how we implemented GDPR at WSO2. So GDPR is a privacy regulation in Europe, so you all know about that, and it's enabled uh, since uh, 25th May this year. It's uh, unlike the previous one, uh, it's a regulation. So the, the main difference between a regulation and a directive is uh, uh, directive basically gives the directions and uh, each state in Europe, they can implement or absorb those directions to their own regulation. So there is no one regulation across all the states in Europe. So because of that, people started to uh, experience a lot of issues when you transfer data between states in Europe. And there were like a lot of inconsistencies too, like how you interpreted the the directive and how you implemented that. So that varied from state to state. But it was there, the DPD was there for more than 20 years. Then because of those drawbacks, they came up with GDPR as a regulation. So regulation means states, they do not need to do anything uh, at, at the state level. They simply need to implement the regulation. It's a single regulation for every state in Europe. I think this is what we discussed. So whose data are protected? So there are two main, uh, main parties. So one is uh, the people who are in Europe, who are in EU. So their data are protected under GDPR, irrespective of who collect the data. Right? It can be a US company, it can be a EU company, Whatever the company, wherever the company, if you collect data from EU residents, then you need to be GDPR compliant. So it's just EU residents, like you need to be in EU. That doesn't mean you need to be a EU citizen, right? Then the other part is any company that exists in EU, if they collect data of anyone around the world, they still need to be GDPR compliant. So that's why GDPR is not just a EU standard, its impact is global. So everyone is affected from GDPR. So there are a couple of ambiguities, right? So by the, by, by the way, like I'm not a lawyer, right? So I'm, I'm a technical, we have a lawyer in the room too. Right? <laughs> so I'm no, not a lawyer, so don't, don't like directly go by what I say. So you need to consult your lawyers. And uh, then again, like this is a regulation. So these are not like technical specification, right? So when you read a technical specification, you know exactly what to do, right? But in, in law, there are a lot of ambiguities, like maybe they have kept it purposely because you can, you, the, it's the court who makes interpretation of the law, right? So this is the first time we see GDPR, but as the time goes on, people will, inter the courts will interpret in different ways and then uh, you can come up with a concrete, uh, concrete way to implement that. So there are little, uh, Ambiguities, for example, let's say uh, it's, an, it's an American citizen, right, who visit EU. And that point, a US company collects its data, right? So how do we interpret that? So it's a US citizen, it's a US company collects the data, 
but at the point of collection, the user is in Europe. Right? So the, spec does, the, the regulation doesn't specifically uh, mention at which point, whether it's at the point of data processing or at the point of data collection, we need to apply GDPR. But people believe it should be at the point of data collection. So even if you are a US citizen, if you visit Europe, and if you're data collected by an American company at that point while you are in Europe, that US company has to be GDPR compliant. Right? So which data are protected? Right? Personal data of any, uh, any person, this is applicable for live people, right? living people. Any personal data are subjected to GDPR. Right? So once again, definition of PII or personal data is ambiguous. It says any data that can be used directly or indirectly to find out who you are will be treated as personal data. So that includes your first name, last name, email address, a phone number, then if you access a website, your IP address, cookies, uh, everything. So all those data fall under personal data. And also there's a special category of data which includes your, your political beliefs, uh, your, your religion, and your biometrics, genetic data, all of those things fall under uh, a special category of data. So there are different ways you need to handle the normal personal data and the special category of data. Yeah. Yes, then what's meant by processing? Processing means anything that you, can, you do with data. It's like a collection of data, uh, like uh, data transfer, storing of data, any activity you do with data falls under processing. So what businesses will get impacted? I think we discussed this. Yeah. So then again, right, it depends on the, the level of interest you have on EU to do your business. Say, for example, so you have a, EU, a, a website in Australia, right? So where you can register your email address and you send set of like newsletters monthly, right? But this, is, this website is running in Australia. That means like anyone around the world can come and register. But they don't specifically look for EU citizens or EU residents or do any marketing campaigns uh, and promote this in EU. They don't have specific offers to EU citizens. And also, like, uh, uh, if they do any specific shipping, they don't have any specific shipping mechanism to EU. They don't show any special interest to people in EU. So in that case, they need not to worry about GDPR. It's open for anyone. It's, it's an English website. It's not in any of the EU languages. It's in the .com domain, not in any of the like country domains of EU. Then you don't need to worry about GDPR. But once again, like if if that's a case, you need to prove that you you haven't shown any interest in EU, right? And there's another like uh, tricky thing, like even though you don't businesses in EU, maybe you have an idea to do businesses in the EU in the future. So in that case. Maybe you track the IP addresses of the users who are coming to a website and see the behavior of those IP, the, the users who are coming from EU. Right? In that case, you are subjected to GDPR. There are two main parties involved. One is a data controller, and the other one is a data processor. Right? So data controller is the uh, one who decides which data to collect, how to process the data, and everything. Right? Data processor is the one possibly would like process the data. Right? So the more responsibility in GDPR lies on the controller. Yeah. For example, like uh, you collect set of data and then you process that data in AWS. So you are the controller and the AWS is the processor. Both have to be GDPR compliant, but the main responsibility lies on the controller. So whenever the controller picks a processor, the controller should make sure the processor complies with GDPR. 
In case of a GDPR violation, both the processor and controller are accountable for that. Yeah, so this is the high level organizational structure. So you have the controller and processor, right? So a given controller can have multiple processors. You can use AWS, you can use Google Cloud, or any other processors. And then the controllers, they have to report to supervisory authority. So each state will have a supervisory authority. In case of any data breach or any, any complaint from the subjects or the users, they can do that at the supervisory authority. And then we have data protection officers. Both the controller and processor can have a data pro protection officer. Those can be internal or even external. A given data protection officer can serve multiple controllers or multiple processors. So their responsibility is to drive the GDPR initiative in the organization, give directions, and, and to make sure it goes fine. And they are responsible to report to the supervisory authority. And if you, if you do businesses in EU, but both the control and processor are outside the EU, then you need to have some sort of a like represent, representative in one of the EU states. OK. So uh, the GDPR defines set of uh, rights for the subject or the user. One is the right to access or right to be informed. Whenever you sign up a user or whenever, whenever you collect the personal data from a user, you need to inform the exact purpose of that data collection. You should not try to collect data for future stuff. Say, for example, you have a restaurant, but it doesn't do any delivery today. But when somebody is doing a reservation, you may ask for the home address. But that is not needed now. right? You may have plans to do delivery in the future, so you may, you, you may decide to start collecting home address from now onwards. You shouldn't do that. You should only collect the data you need for now. And you need to inform how you process that data. And if it's a controller, you need to specify uh, how you are going to process this data. And if you are going to transfer this data to a different country, you need to specify which country you are going to transfer this data. You need to specify your privacy policy and need to keep your uh, subject informed as much as you can. And also, you need to educate the subject about their rights to complain. You need to share your information. You need to give the contact details of your data protection officer and the supervisory authority. Then the right to rectification. At, at any point, if subject believes his data is not correct or data needs to be corrected, he should have the right to do that. And the data controller should facilitate doing that. Maybe you would have a portal or some kind of way that your consumers can log in and request access to rectify any of the issues they see in their personal data. Then right to erasure, or oh, this is also known as try to be forgotten. At any point, if the subject believes his data needs to be removed totally or part of the data, they should have the right to do that. There should be a way to request it and also the control has to implement it. But this is, once again, a little tricky. You may have other local regulation that you have to keep data for some, some period. In that case, you don't need to delete that data, but if it goes to court, you need to prove that you have a legitimate right to keep that data. And also, the subjects should have a right to request to stop processing data. Not to delete data, keep the data, but you should not process my data. Just store it, that's enough. This may be useful in a case like uh, uh, the, the subject files a case against, against you. To prove that case against the, in the courts, you need to have the data. So you can request not to erase, but to stop processing my data. Then data portability is another important aspect. You should let your subscribers to export the data from your system. 
any personal data. So this could include uh, any of the profile updates, any interactions pattern, the service providers, the IDPs that I visited, all those data should be exported. And once again, GDPR doesn't specify the format of, uh, format of this data when you export it out. So it can be defined by different verticals, like, for example, insurance domain, so they may come together and decide this is a format we want. Banking domain can decide this is a format they want, but it's not specifically mentioned in the, the regulation. And also, it is not required to let users export all the data. Like, for example, it, it may be like processed in a way you want, with your specialized skills, you may derive certain patterns. Then you should not, I mean, it's your decision, you may not need to let users export those data. You can decide which data to export or not. Yeah, any questions? This may be a kind of premature question, but if uh, you have PII on a user who's using a system and you're generating log data, is that log data that might contain information about the user's activity also covered as part of the portability rule? Would you be required to hand that over, say my website behavior on Facebook or whatever, is that part of the portability re requirement? Yeah, so, so one thing it's unclear, right? So it doesn't specify like uh, which data needs to be exported. It says the personal data, right? Any data that, that you can identify the user, if the user request, you should be able to export. But once again, so log data doesn't directly, uh, directly relate to the user, right? It's something derived from our end, right? With our specialized tool in those stuff. In that case, I don't see a requirement that like uh, need to export that, but once again, I'm not very clear we need to export that data or not. Any other questions before we go to the next session? Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. So I think you all learn about the GDPR. So I think GDPR or implementing some uh, privacy compliance project is something like to like swimming. So it's easy to learn the stuff, right? But it's very tricky to implement that thing. So we all face that situation when we try to implement that thing. I think even if the GDPR is not applied to you, I think sooner or later you have to work with the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act, I guess. So uh, this is the story about how we implemented the GDPR compliance within the WSO2. So at the beginning, we had uh, this kind of question. So if you implemented GDPR, you might have uh, got this uh, question set. Uh, we are to start. Uh, what are the parties that involved in this implementation? Uh, what are the legal obligations that we have to face? And even after we implement this thing, how do we say that we are compliant with GDPR? So those are the question set that we faced. And the in implementing this kind of uh, thing, uh, there are several things involved. The first thing is the people. We sh should identify the people that we need to gather to implement this thing. It's, it's not only the, the software developers. We have to find the legal people and we have to go with the HR team, and a lot more people should involve with this process. And then again, we need to identify the, the correct processors uh, in, in, the, in the software side, and the HR side, and the marketing side. We need to identify the correct processors we need to follow. At the same time, we need to find the correct technology. So if our software doesn't support to implement a GDPR solution or privacy compliant solution, it doesn't work. If, it's our, if our network player doesn't support, it doesn't work. So in that case, we need to identify the correct technologies uh, that we need to implement uh, any privacy compliant solution in the system. 
then how do we implement this uh, privacy compliance project? So what are the steps that we need to follow? The first thing is uh, we need to build the awareness within your organization. So if you are implementing the GDPR, we need to build internal knowledge uh, within our in, uh, company. Then we need to identify whether we are affected or not. If we identify only, we can implement that kind of solution. So the, if we identify and if we know that we are affected, then we wanted to know uh, the impact on the current data. Because if we have run through a long years, there should be more data with us. So we need to understand the impact of the current data uh, that we have. Then again, we need to review the, the current processes. So then after we understand the current processes, then we can identify how to change those processes. Then the implementation phase. So we can discuss the implementation phase. So once we implement, so we are done with the implementation part, then we need to review the all the policies again. So those policies should be publicly available. Those people should be able to read that one, so they will understand that one. So since this is GDPR, at the end, we need to find the DPO, so he is responsible for the next time the people come and ask the questions. So that's the path to implement the GDPR. So if you're implementing another compliance project, you may can remove this DPO, but there should be someone responsible for this thing. And again, this is not a one-time task. So you have to first plan the things and uh, implement that one and check again whether this is compliant with the things. If it's not, again, we have to go through this cycle. Then this is how we plan within WSO2. Actually, we started uh, uh, to implement the GDPR compliancy in late in last, uh, last year, uh, November and December. Uh, no, uh, I think December. We started that one. Uh, in the planning phase was started in the December. It means first we gathered people from the special from the identity and access management team and set of people from the legal team. We formed that team and they went exploring about GDPR and built that knowledge initially. Then we started doing the company-wide gap analysis. For so that one, we get the help from an external lawyers as well, I think. Yeah, we got the help from the, the lawyers in the UK. So because they were aware of that one before we start doing that one. So with the help of them, we got some uh, gap analysis questions and then we did then uh, data protection impact assessment within the organization using that uh, question here as well. So we uh, review the impact of current data that we have and we went through the, the processes we are following and we identified the gap, gaps as uh, gaps in that areas. Then we uh, plan our execution plan. To execute the things, then we form another group the core GDPR team we formed initially, and then we took people from the uh, engineering team, and we took another people from the legal team, uh, digital operations, and the cloud team. They are responsible for the internal uh, software uh, infrastructure, and HR, marketing, uh, and sales teams. And again, we identify the ways we collect the, the personal data to the system. It can be while, while we are doing the sales, so when we are recruiting the people, there are many ways that we collect the information. And how do we share the information? We are not uh, selling the, the personal information that we are collect, and we are not uh, uh, sharing this information with the outside people, but we are sharing this information with our subsidiaries, so we have to identify those things. So we identified that thing as well. Then the execution phase. So here I'll roughly discuss what we did. I don't go into that much detail, but I'll just explain what we did in each areas. So in the digital operation, so this is the, the infrastructure, the uh, software and the infrastructure we have. So that team, what they first did is, they first review the, the, the procedures they are following, and they document that one. And they are step by step, they went through that one and periodically update that uh, the documents and processes. And 
they create a new alerting system to identify whether some data breaches happen in the system. So it, it was not previously there. So that is very important. So they again review the, all the network layer uh, and the, all the firewall rules that ha they have. The, so they have reviewed those stuff. Then they change uh, some of the stuff as well. Then uh, they start to, it means they were previously also applying the security patches in the system, but uh, they started to doing that periodically, check whether there are updates and apply that one. And then uh, the, the data in the rest also play, play a major role. So if, let's say, if someone take our laptop, they, then we may exposing the, the personal information to the other, others. So due to that reason, we started encrypting all the data. Then in the, in the legal front, what we did was, so there are different applications that we are connecting with. So we evaluate the, the terms and conditions we had and see whether that is comply with the GDPR. If not, we add some attendance to uh, those policies. And then the uh, legal team uh, started doing a sessions to the each team. So uh, for the marketing teams, for the sales team, they did uh, several workshops. So all the team members in those teams uh, now understand about the GDPR. They know what the precautions and what the procedures they need to follow uh, to comply with the GDPR. Then in the sales team, so in the previously, uh, there were not the spot concept. So all the sales team members could access the all the sales information. So now we restrict that one. Only the relevant sales people can access to the relevant sales detail because we have limited the access. Then uh, we can guarantee that those information will not go to the uh, uh, unwanted people. And and we eliminate the third party contact list we have purchased. Uh, now no longer we know get the the contact information from the outside. We rely only the information that we get from our reliable uh, sources. And again, we improve our sales tools to uh, match with the, the consents that we get from the users. So before we send the mail, let's say we ask, before we send the marketing mail, now the sales people know and see whether there is an active consent for doing that. If there's, a not, there's no consent to sell a promotional email, they won't send that email now. So in the marketing front, so uh, we update our uh, cookie policy and the privacy policy. So we update the, the, the sites and uh, social media and every places with the latest uh, privacy policies and the cookie policies. And we add the consent uh, box for the, uh, all the web forms. So now when you, if you go to the WSO2 sites and when you fill something, uh, there's another place to uh, give the consent as well. Uh, and then, then again, uh, once users come to the uh, sites, if they are just visiting the site, we just let them to be anonymous. But if they are doing some activity, let's say they download the product, if they download an article, we ask them to create account before that one. So then we create a use account for those users and then they can go in the normal GDPR path. It means they can log into their user portal and see all the data that we have collected on them. And if they can ask whether they need to delete and if they like to like, they can change the, the consents they, then they have given to us. And again, the most important thing was we have to clean up the, all the data we had. So we went through the, all the data if we didn't have the enough consents, we send some mails to get the consent. If we were unable to do that one, we had to delete that data. In the HR and uh, admin point of view, uh, for the old employees, we did some trainings to train them and uh, enhance their knowledge about the personal data protection. And we have added this information to the, the employee handbook as well. So uh, that are the things that we do in HR point of view. And again, we did another uh, uh, background check of the, all the people in handling this personal data. Uh, that's another thing that we did. So uh, that is the, the implementation related things that we did. Uh, at the end, we inter, uh, uh, appointed the DPO intern. So 
uh, after the, the, the GDPR knowledge gaining process we identified, we now uh, our internal people are capable of handling that one. So we select one of them and assign as a uh, DPO. And the challenges we faced. The, the main challenge was the timeline. So we started in, in December. So we had around four months to complete this project. So that the timeline is the, the biggest challenge we face. And the second thing is the, uh, we had lot of marketing data we have collected. So we have to analyze those data and see whether we can take this or not. And again, uh, the, there are different data flows globally. We have customers in the globally. So we had to deal with how to handle that as well. So that's how we implement GDPR within our organization. Uh, so I think this may be useful to you as well if you are implementing that kind of project in the future. So any questions related to this? Okay, thank you then. Maybe we can uh, also discuss how we, uh, how we implemented this in identity server. Uh, so if you don't have any questions, uh, since you have a few more minutes. So uh, as an identity architect, so there are a few things that you need to know. So the first one is like you need to decouple the business data or the transactional data from your identity data, personal data. Right, so you are, the, the personal data can be under a single source of truth, that's your IDP, but don't combine that with any transactional data. Let two applications handle your transactional data. And let them worry about the PII aspect, GDPR aspect of those data. Your identity provider, as an identity architect, you worry about the, the, the GDPR aspect of your personal data. For example, uh, you may have a set of service providers internally, right? So, we, and when you share, when you, like, in the login flow, right? So, let, there can be one service provider ask for your email address. You get redirected to your IDP, and when the IDP shares that email address with that service provider, from the IDP side, you only need to ask the consent to share that email address with the, with the service provider, that's all. But when you go to the, the service provider, it's the service provider's responsibility to get the consent from the user for the purpose of collecting that email address. So you need to find out the boundary. There can be a case, it, it, it may hurt the user experience, but once again, it's based on your deployment. If you see both the IDP and the service provider, they are in the same trust domain, then you can make the experience much better by getting the consent at a one place. So that is what we are going to support in Identity Server's next version 5.7.0. Identity Server would be, the 5.6.0 version can only handle the consent of the, the IDP itself. But with 5.7.0, which we are going to release in a couple of months, it can handle the consent of other service providers too. In other words, you can offload the consent management from your service providers and give it to the IDP. But still, I didn't, I didn't, the, you, the transactional data will be under your own service providers or applications. Yeah, so mutable identifiers, immutable private identifiers, and uh, mutable public identifiers, right? So, so that means whenever you store record in your IDP, don't use like email address or username as anything as the key identifier. Use a private immutable identifier that will never change. That's for your own reference. So that means in GDPR, the user should have the flexibility to change any of their personal data. If you, if you register a user with email address as a username, then you should still allow to change your email address because email address is a personal data. So then changing the username would be hard if you use that as the identifier because that is the identifier which will go into all the logs. To avoid that, have one immutable private identifier. It can be just a UUID that you generate. It can be just a pseudonym. Right? Use a pseudonym and store all the PII data against a pseudonym. Whenever you share that attribute with other parties, then use public mutable identifiers. Those can be the email address or anything. The service provider can decide who, how to identify the user at the service provider side. 
can be a phone number, email address, even it can be a pseudonym generated for that particular service provider, IDP combination. Okay. So declare and get the consent for the IAM cookie policy. So from the IDP side also, you need to decide, like, how are you going to present your cookie policy? You need to explain uh, how long you're going to keep those cookies and what information you are going to uh, put on those cookies and how you are going to process those cookies. So you need to specify that, share that with the users and get their consent. So this is Facebook cookie policy. This is a Google cookie policy. And also you need to get the consent for the privacy policy. This is from the IDP side. This is an example uh, privacy data uh, uh, use policy from Facebook. The, this is what I discussed before. Always record user attributes against a pseudonym. So whenever, even for the logs, right? So whenever you push user data logs or analytic systems, record that or push those analytics, analytics against pseudonym. Then have one table which maps the pseudonym to PII data. So the analytic system will have like anonymous data. All the records are against pseudonym, no PII data there. Only at the point you render the data, you get the data from the analytic system, then you find the mapping from another table, then you display the meaningful data. So at any point, if user requests to delete, you only need to remove the data mapping. You don't need to delete anything. So once you delete the mapping between pseudonym to PII data, you make all the other data anonymous. So anonymous data, it's fine under GDPR. Collect only the minimal required data, so that uh, that's quite straightforward. And share personal data with user consent, so whenever you share personal data with someone else, make sure you do that with the user's consent. And you need to have a self-care portal Users should be able to log in to this particular portal and request to, to change their, revoke their consent, right? So one, another, another aspect in the consent is, users should be able to give the consent for a given period, not forever. Like, yes, I, I let you share my email address with full service provider, but only for six months. And users should be able to log in to the, the self-care portal and change that, and also revoke the consent and see how the service providers are using the attributes. And request to delete, and, and also to do any complaint, right? So there should be a self-care portal to do all those stuff. And user offboarding, so whenever you delete the, delete the user, you need to make sure all the PII data are removed, and also you need to inform all the other service providers who you share data with. This is a little tricky, right? For example, you, there can be a website where, which collects your email address. With your consent, that website collects your uh, email address and displays it on the website. Now, Google can collect that data and cache it, your email address, right? So now user comes to you and tell, delete my user record. All, then you can delete all the PIA data under your control, and what you can do is you can inform Google to remove that entry, but it's not your responsibility. If this goes to the courts, then you need to prove that you have done all your best to remove all the PI data shared with other service providers and other entities. Yeah, any questions? Anything you want to share about your, yeah. So not to keep harping on the logs, but the audit piece that you've, you mentioned at one point in the slide deck that IP addresses should not be captured. So yeah, yeah. from a kind of security management perspective, if there's an incident and you don't have that type of information, you're kind of, you, 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 you might not be able to resolve the issue or find the, the bad actor who's doing whatever they're doing against your system. How do you, what, what are your thoughts about how to remediate that? Yeah, yes. So once again, right, even, even for the IP address and other stuff, you can go with the pseudonym, right? So once again, it's fine to keep IP address in logs. The challenge is if the user requests to remove that, delete, then you need to go through all the logs and remove it. 
So one workaround is you keep those IP addresses with some other one, one place, one table where you can easily get rid of, and to the audit logs, you do as, you press the audit. Then you have an, you create a new tool to whenever you want to go to the audit logs, see the audit logs, which will do the mapping between this table and your actual audit logs and show you some meaningful data. So if user wants to delete a record, you just need to remove all the data that you record against that PI, against that particular user's ID in that in that particular table. You don't need to remove all the logs.